Now let me, uh, just so I can get it on tape, William Aller. Yes. And you go by William or Bill? Bill, or? I go by Bill, Bill. yeah. Right. Uh, so are you from this area originally? No, I am from Seattle originally. I was born and raised in Seattle, went to school over there in Seattle, and uh, uh, went to Edison Vocational School for a year before I went in the Navy, and then I got into the Navy V-12 program, and uh, they, uh, they uh, enlisted me to say, I d received my, my draft notice to, to be <laughs> drafted on the, thir the 15th of May, 1943, and I was waiting to get uh, to see if I would be accepted in this Navy program, which had just started up two months before, and so I was sweating it out, and all of a sudden I got this draft notice, and I thought, great, here I'm going to be called into the, sent in the Army and overseas, and maybe there's a chance I could get in the Navy. And uh, so I went down and talked to the, the uh, uh, people at the, uh, the uh, well, whatever it was, the induction center, and they said, well, you would have to get okay from, from your draft boards. So I went back to the draft board to see if I could get a one week's delay to see if my notice would come in during that time because I knew it was, it was about due about that time. And uh, they said, if you'd wanted a delay, you should have asked for it when you, were, when you were classified last fall. And I said, well, that was before this program even came up. I said, Wait, so this is kind of a rotten deal. If I can't even get a week's delay, what are you, you going to lose on it? Uh, no, you can't do it. And as I said, I'm afraid that was the only time in my life I've ever been very tempted to hit two, le two old ladies, <laughs> but I didn't. And uh, so I went back, I went down to the uh, induction center and talked to them again. They said, well, uh, try, uh, uh, go, go talk to the Naval Officer Procurement. So I went back to the Naval Officer Procurement and they said, well, the tests are being, I mean, the the review board is meeting on Thursday and Friday of this week, and uh, we'll know on Friday night. And I said, that won't do me any good on Saturday because there's no Saturday mail. And I said, so will you, you come down here uh, Friday night about 4.30, and then you'll know. And if you get, you're get in, fine. If you're not, then at least you have it cleared up. I lost seven pounds that week. So, so anyway, I... Uh, uh, I went down there on Friday and I walked in and the chief yelled at me, Aller, you're in. So I thought, well, boy, my, you could have ran your hands under my, my feet because I didn't, uh, uh, <laughs> I was really surprised. So the next morning I went down to the induction center and there were 80 people going through, through the process there. And there was a big sergeant, big Marine sergeant there. And he says, now, gentlemen, he says, your chances of getting in the service of your choice is, is good this morning. So you put down the, your choice. And, of course, Seattle being a seaport town, uh, there were more that would wanted to go in the Navy than the, than the Army. And so I put it down and we went through the whole procedure that morning and got up to the final deal and they said get in the separate lines and we got in the separate lines and then we met in and met the reviewing board and there, were, there was a first lieutenant in the uh, Army, one in the Air, Army Air Corps, one in the Marine Corps and one in the Navy. and. Uh, as we went, walked in the room, it was, the Navy's full, you're in the Army, the Navy's full, you're in the Army, the Navy's full, you're in the Army, and I said, no, you're not, I'm not, and I handed them my papers, and I guess I was the first uh, V-12 to be inducted because none of the rest of them would receive their notices until the next week or so, and then they would have a couple weeks to re report. So that was wonderful. So then they said, okay, th congratulations, and so they sent me over to the Navy and I went through the same procedure again for the afternoon. More blood tests, more x-rays, more, more poking and, and what have you. So I went, but I was a little happier at that time. And so I went through that routine. They, and then they sent me, they gave me, wrote up, typed up the, the, all the necessary papers and I signed everything else. And then I was uh, declared a member of the United States Naval Reserve and sent home. And, and then I thought, well, great. I'm, I wonder where, what's next. I'll be called up and they'll tell me what school I'm going to. And so uh, I got home and next week I got a letter that said, uh, uh, you were placed on inactive duty and you'll probably be called in November. And I thought, what? <laughs> you know, here I've been fooling around with all this nonsense and, and sweating it out and everything else. Now they're going so I said, well, what, what can I do? And I said, well, you can uh, you go into agricultural work. And I said, not, not for me. And I said, you could would go into war work. And I said, that wouldn't do me any good because nobody's going to want me for three months. And I said, well, you can go to school. 
So I went out to the University of Washington and I said, well, can I get into the University of Washington? He says, well, you passed all the tests and all, you're okay. So, so I signed up for all these courses and went out there. And when I was out there, I found out that I was in most of these same classes that all these V12s that had just been called up to start 1st of July <laughs> would, would be in class. So here I was the only civilian sitting in here with maybe two or three hundred uh, Navy and Marine Corps guys and they all kind of looked at me and wondered what in the hell is he doing in here, you know. And so I managed to go through that first semester, but it was pretty hard on me because we lived in West Seattle and it took me two hours every morning to get to the U. Yeah, I'd take buses and tractor trolleys and everything else. It took me two hours to get this class and two hours to get home because old Spokane Street there in Seattle was all, all trains, you know, and the, the bus would go about a block and then a train had crossed and then it'd go another block and another train had crossed. So this went on and on and on, you know, so that was the fun and games. So, so I went through the, that, uh, this, the uh, summer part and I was taking a, a math class. I took a, signed up for a bonehead math class because it had been three years since I'd had any math in high school, and that wasn't my strongest deal. And knowing that the Navy was going to be requiring some math, I, I took a bonehead math class. And he was an excellent instructor, Dr. Gerbert. And uh, so I worked real hard, and I tried, and it was a five-day class. It was the only class I had five days of the week. And so I'd, on Friday, it'd take me two hours to get out there and take one hour class, and then two hours to get home. And so we got up to the final week and the weather kind of changed and I got a strep throat and I ended up with a temperature of about 102 or 103. And those are the days where you didn't have penicillin and sulfur and what have you to take care of it. So I, uh, I went in and took the test and boy, it was miserable. So when I went in to get my grade, I got a D in the course. I'd had a B up until then. And I, what what did you do this for? And he says, well, that's what you got on your final exam. And I said, well, what about all these quizzes we took on Fridays? All these Fridays I've been spending f five hours of my life coming out here for this stuff. Oh, well, those were just for your you know, <laughs> edification there. They don't, didn't count for anything. Not great. So anyway, I thought, well, okay. So then I got the orders to, to show up at the University of Washington to, for the V-12 unit and on the 1st of November and I reported in and, and got checked in and all and checked into the old beta house out at the University of Washington and met my roommates. They were a neat bunch of guys and they were all younger than they, they had all just got out of high school so there were two, most of them were just, have just turned 17 and here I was, I was 20 after the first week I was at, in the deal. You know. So I was at the University of Washington in the, the V-12 unit there and uh, that was an interesting uh, period there because we'd get up at, well, really, we were supposed to get up at 6.30 for, for uh, exercise in the morning, but it was double daylight saving time. So in other words, we were up at 5.30 in the morning running around there. So we'd get up and we'd run for I don't know how many miles in the fog and what have you, and then uh, we'd get up and then start our classes. And, uh, you know, the normal... Uh, Enrollment of a student is oh, 12 to, four, to 15 credit hours. Well, we had anywhere from 18 to 22 credit hours. Uh, the first semester I was, I mean, I had classes from 8 until 5 every day. And then, uh, uh, so I got through that, that semester all right. And then the uh, second semester I started, they, uh, I was taking uh, oh, cripes, uh, calculus and and uh, well, a number of engineering courses, and things way out of my, my line. I'd had a year of art in, in Edison Vocational School. It was commercial art and production illustration, but not, not this. And so, and my roommates were all top, top of the line, you know, one, top 1% uh, or nationally, and Phi Beta Kappa material, and I wasn't. So we, I had to work a little harder, but to, uh, there was one class in descriptive geometry that we took, and it was one of these that a metalsmith would have to take, you know, when you put a pipe together, and where they'd take a room 12 by 18 and say, okay, you're going to run a pipe from two feet in from this side and three feet in from this side and going up to another part. So then you had to figure out how you were going to cut the, the pipe so it would fit in there. 
and that sort of stuff. Well, I, I was doing it all the time, and one of my roommates was taking the class the hour ahead of me, and he was getting straight A's, and I was getting D's and F's. And I said, well, look, I get the same answer as you. What's the problem here? So after about six or eight weeks of the footness and spending my time on, on restriction because of a low grade in one class, I found out that I was approaching the subject from, uh, from uh, a, a clockwise manner, and the instructor, who was a professor, was doing it in the counterclockwise manner, and so I was wrong, and he wouldn't change, and so I got stuck. <laughs> so anyway, we got that figured out, <laughs> and, and the the same class, I would take a piece of tracing paper, scotch tape, and an, a razor blade to class with me, and as we figured out these plans, I would. Uh, draw them on the tracing paper and cut them out and try sticking them together. And if they didn't stick together right, I knew I made a error and I'd go back and correct it. Oh, that was cheating. And then I realized that the, the uh, uh, business of doing these training aids is what it was one of the biggest ones in the country. <laughs> After that, I would have made a million dollars if I'd been, been uh, in the open, open market. So anyway, we uh, plugged along there and the week just before uh, midterms in the spring of 44, uh, on a Sunday I didn't feel too good, and on Monday we went out for calisthenics, and I went down for deep knee bends, and I couldn't get up. So I went in and checked in with, the, with sick bay, and they thought, well, Monday, you know, everybody's a goof off, all these <laughs> the usual <laughs> crap. And so I... Uh, they checked me over, and finally they took my blood and checked things over and found out I had a rheumatic fever. And so they stuck me in bed for seven weeks. And I, didn't, I couldn't read, I couldn't do anything, and here I was sitting there on top of, I think it was 18 or 19 credit hours that I was supposed to be finished, you know, book reports and chemistry labs and everything else. And so I, at the end of the seven weeks, it was about a week before the finals, <laughs> I got out and I t talked to the... Uh, the uh, uh, Navy advisor and said, well, what am I supposed to do? And he says, well, go around, talk to all your instructors, and find out which classes you can, you could complete if you, you know, took the final and what have you, because there, there are those classes that you can do that. So I went out and I found three, three teachers that would, would uh, give me credit if I finished up. And there are a number of others that, that said, well, I'm sorry, but you, you've got four book reports. You've got 5,000-word book reports, and you've got this and that. So they are very sorry, but they'd give me an honorable uh, dropout anyway. So then they went down to the Navy or the university uh, counselor, the one that was the, the in-between between the Navy and the, and the uh, university. And I went down and he, into his office. I went into his office, and I... Uh, I told the, his receptionist that I needed to see him and what it was about. And she said, well, sit down and he'll get in touch with you. And I could see him through the door. He didn't know I could see him. But he was just sitting there, you know, twiddling his fingers and playing with his pencil and whatever. So he let me sit there for about 20 minutes, and then he rings the button that I can come in. And I thought, oh, crap, one of these. So I went in, and I, told, I explained to him what the situation was, that I had been in the hospital for seven weeks, I'd missed my midterms, I wasn't prepared for my finals, and so I need to get be honorably discharged from these different classes. And he looked up at me and he says, absolutely not. He says, I, I understood that Navy was only choosing superior students. <laughs> oh, I was figured at that time, I was wondering, well, do you, do you think you could do this, buddy? <laughs> and so he, uh, he said, no, I won't approve it. So I thought, okay, so I left, and I went back to the Navy advisor, and he said, oh, to hell with him, and <laughs> signed me off and got, made sure I got, got into the two, two or three classes there to get things straightened out. So in uh, the end of June of 1944, uh, they transferred seven of us that were in the V-12 program, which only took, it was a special program, you know, that only had so many quarters, and then you went to, to uh, uh, officer's candidate school and got your commission. So, but that's what I would have had under the uh, initial program, but, they, but then they transferred uh, seven of us down to UCLA in the Naval ROTC, which would mean that we would have had seven semesters. And uh, 
these were basically the ones that they, I guess, that they wanted to, to uh, supplement the people from the Navy Academy that would be getting out or would be killed and what have you. And so we, re we reported to UCLA, and at the time, uh, I didn't know anything about UCLA. I'd only been to Los Angeles once in 1940 for a two-week visit. And so I went down to the library and dug through the books and found the usual catalogs and what have you, and here's a little tiny uh, printout of the layout of the, of the campus. And I thought, my gosh, <laughs> that's hardly a campus at all. So when we got down there, we found out that there were only 9,000 students at UCLA at that time. And our uh, uh, dormitory was the old women's dorm, which was in Westwood Village. So we had about a mile's walk from, from the where we slept and lived and what have you, to campus. And so uh, we'd march up there every morning and march back every night and had our classes in our, uh, they, they took over the student union building and turned it into the mess hall for us. <coughs> and, uh, so I was there at UCLA from 1940, uh, July 1st to 1944, up through, uh, February 23rd in 1946. Well, the thing, I mean, they kept us busy. I mean, we were really going, and in between, between semesters, we would report down to, to Terminal Island and, and go out on these minesweepers and these, these uh, 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 other yard craft and what have you. And I remember there was one incident that kind of amused me, and I still can think about it. We were out on this minesweeper, and we were coming in from uh, maneuvers off out there by uh, um, Catalina Island, and I saw this guy step out of the uh, out of the cabin, and he was he had kind of a weird look on his face, and he was carrying a forty-five. And I thought, "Whoops!" And then I saw a hand hand come out of the out of the door with a big meat platter come down on top of his head <laughs> and drag him back in. That was all. This. So, so that was kind of, kind of interesting. But uh, So we went through all this training. And there were quite a few people in the unit there. It was a good-sized unit, but not as big as the University of Washington was. But one of my roommates was six foot seven inches tall, and so uh, I always know where he was, and so it was kind of interesting. But we, uh, so we went through all of our training there, and of course, when uh, in August of 1945, uh, UCLA realized that the war was over and they didn't need us or they didn't want us anymore, and the whole attitude changed. I mean, you know, get, 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 go away, we don't need you and everything. And so there were all kinds of things that, uh, that were kind of strange there. And so, anyway, uh, we were to get our commissions on, in February, of, uh, of 46, I uh, received a notice from the, oh, a notice came out and said to tell us that we were not regular students. All of us were, were special students there at the, at the mercy of the BA, uh, University of California, and that we would have to, if we, if we wanted to enter the college, this is as I'm a top senior, you know, I've had, this is my eighth semester of college. Uh, that you would have to apply for admission. So I paid my $5 and sent my card in and I, I requested uh, uh, entrance as a regular student and I'd met a young lady during my stay there that uh, uh, I married. And so uh, uh, just before, the week before uh, the graduation, which would have been, I would be graduating, getting married and commissioned all on the same day, uh, they, uh, sent my card back to me, denied because of this low, this D from the University of Washington. So here my old buddy from the University of Washington is, was shafted to me. So, so, but, so, so basically I was number 58 in a class of 58 getting their commissions at the times. So, and we were all at the, uh, uh, all of the V-12s or all of the UCLA uh, people and all the other ROTC units around the country of course, here they had 2,000 ensigns. What are you going to do with them? So they sent us all back to Newport, Rhode Island, and we were back in Newport for a month, and then we were assigned to the USS Montpelier, uh, which was a, a, a light cruiser of Cruiser Division 14, and there were four cruisers in this division, 
the, the Montpelier, the Cleveland, the Columbia, and the Denver. So uh, we were 500 on e of, of us on each ship. So you can imagine what, what that was. So we weren't really treated as officers. We were treated as who are you? You know, if you're wearing a hat with a bit with a with a pin on it and a gold bar on it, but that doesn't mean anything. So we spent. Uh, so my wife and I uh, went back to Newport, and she stayed there for a month. And then we found a lieutenant who was a, a, a school teacher who was going back to Los Angeles, and he needed somebody to help him drive back to. Los Angeles, and we thought that'd be all right. So she, she headed west, and I stayed on the East Coast. And uh, so we were in, in at, the, at the training station there at Newport for a month, and then we reported aboard the, the cruisers, and then started a tour of uh, shipboard training, you know, gunnery practice and all the rest of the stuff. And uh, we went down to Bermuda for a couple of days, and when we and then we went up to to Maine, uh, Casco Bay, Maine, and then we uh, eventually we went to uh, and then down to New York, and uh, we were in New York for a couple of days, and then we went up to Halifax, then on up to Quebec, so we got up to Quebec. Well, um, they asked us, okay, uh, all of you are going to be getting out the first of July. I mean, the, it's like it is today, you know where. We're downgrading. Everybody goes out, except unless unless you request a, an extension of your your duty for uh, for one year. And so I, I I had discussed it with my wife anyway, and we decided that I'd stay in for a year and see how what I, if I liked it or not. Because her dad was a Navy chief for 26 years. He had a real interesting uh, life too. And uh, so I. Uh, uh, I knew I, I applied and was accepted to stay in for a year. So the thing was that the first of July we would be pulling into Philadelphia from Halifax or from uh, Quebec, and we could, uh, uh, th and then uh, things would change from there. So I thought, okay, if by duty, if I'm going to be on the West Coast, I better make reservations for an air airplane ticket to get home, and if uh, if I'm going to be on the East Coast, my wife better have one to come the other way. So we made arrangements on that. So she sent me the money to get the t plane ticket, and I, I got my reservations through a travel agent in Newport, and uh, th and they were supposed to send me my train my plane ticket to the ship. Well, when we're at sea for four or five days going up to Canada, we are not going to get those those tickets. So. Uh, we, we did all of our training and touring and what have you, and there were some, a lot of interesting things going on during that time in Quebec and Halifax and what have you. But uh, when we left Quebec, I found out that, uh, uh, that the uh, ship would be, in, would be moving down to Philadelphia. And so I called the travel agent and told him, okay, send my, my tickets. Um, uh, registered mail so that it would definitely get to me. So, okay, fine. So we took off, and la but we landed in Philadelphia two days early. So they marched everybody off the ship, everybody, ran them off the ship, go. And I said, I can't go anywhere until I get my train ticket. Get off the ship. And so I stood down there until they finally posted a Marine guard at the, uh, at the gangway so that I couldn't get back on the ship. And the, well, this is, I said, I can't do anything. I said, the only thing I can do is if uh, I don't have any money, I don't have any way of getting to the West Coast. And uh, so anyway, um, the postman come back, and he looked like a little, uh, a little uh, uh, dwarf or something. And he was a little pot-bellied guy, and he'd love cigars, so I'd give him all the cigars I got during my stay on the ship. And... Uh, so anyway, he uh, he was come bringing the mail back, and I told him, I said, my, I've got a letter in there I've got to have, and he says, well, you can't get in there, and I said, you're going to get me, you're going you're gonna to look in there, and you're going to find my letter. No, I can't do that, and I said, oh, yes, you are. I said, so you're going to be in big trouble. He says, I, I don't care, I don't have any place to go now. I mean, my, my, my orders are to go to report to San Francisco, and if I don't have a way of getting there, I'm not going to be... I'm going to be a little bit over uh, stressed here, so we went in, and luckily we opened the bag, and my letter was right on top. And here was a, two big bags, and 
Later on, I found the, the mail that was in those two bags didn't get to us until November. It was finally got reached us in November. But, uh, <coughs> but when I was on the ship, I, uh, of course, you know, you, you do what you like to do, and I was an artist, and I, so, so we started the ship's newspaper, and so we published a newspaper uh, once a week for the three months we were on the ship, and uh, I did all the artwork and all the cartooning and everything else. And so as we uh, we get started on it Thursday night and make up, they said we had a little night, a 12, what the small uh, multilith machine. And uh, so we'd lithograph it. So we'd have to do all the stuff on the lithograph plates and type it and, but, and uh, hand draw it and all. And then the ship would, would rock and all the, uh, uh, solution on the press that keeps the ink off the stuff would roll to one end, and so we'd have to take the thing apart and and sew so, uh, so on a new new deal. And by the time we got through, we ended up running it off on a mimeograph machine. So we would work straight for for almost every week. We'd work straight from Thursday night until Saturday morning to get them out so that we could turn them over to the troops in the morning. So I did that for that during that time. So when we were uh, we were the flagship, we had the admiral on board. And so when we got to Bermuda, uh, I was carrying on with uh, the rest of the troops, our drills and all this stuff. And it's an hour report to the, the uh, uh, admiral's cabin. And I said, <laughs> and so I went up there, and, and of course we just were in khakis and a foul weather jacket. The only thing that said I was an ensign it was a, I had a little hat that said a, there was a pin on it, you know, my pins on it. So I went up there and I said. Uh, when we get to Bermuda, the, the Admiral is having a garden party for the officials in Bermuda. And uh, we need invitations written to all these, these people. And so you're it. <laughs> okay. So I sat down and, and in, in a fine Spencerian script wrote the invitations for the Lord and Lady this and Governor General and this and, and Rear Admiral so and so and so on. And, uh, and then very carefully erase them and put them in their envelopes and turn them over to them and they said thank you and that was it and I thought well okay back to the back to the bilges and so we went down so so I mean you so but I, I, I kept on top of things but whenever it went anywhere I usually took care of the paymaster the yeoman or the, the personnel man and the pharmacist mate and the, uh, the guy that handled the, the commissary stewards I mean if they needed any help, I was willing to, to help them out. So I was doing uh, uh, covers for the menus for the Easter deals and things like this. Well, you had, what else do you have? You could sit in an upper, upper gun uh, ammunition handling room while we were going through practice for two or three hours every day. And, and, uh, did, uh, did that have some benefits to you then? Uh, well, it did in the long run. What the first benefit was... I was standing up on deck on watch one day, it was colder than hell, and uh, a hatch opened up and a hand came out and tapped me on the shoulder and I turned around and the guy handed me a ham sandwich and a cup of coffee. <laughs> and so I'm just, the only one up there sitting there with his food and they looked at me sort of aghast, you know, what's going on? It's, well, you know, you take care of these people. So it, it paid off and, uh, and I found when, after I left the ship that I got a, a letter of commendation from the Admiral <laughs> <laughs> for my services, <laughs> which was fine, but it's, it's kind of ridiculous when I think about my brother, dad and brother over there in the South Pacific, and, and they were in, in, in battle all the time. Did your brother go in before you went Well, in? this is interesting. His story, uh, if you could get a hold of him, he's, uh, uh, he'd be, he could give you some real interesting stuff. But uh, he, uh, my dad joined the uh, National Guard about 1934 in Seattle, because he figured the Japs would start a, the war long before they did. And so my brother joined it in 1937 when he was 16. You know, it was the old routine, how old are you? 16, take a walk around the block. How old are you? 17, no, another walk. Okay, how old are you? 18. So he got in and uh, he rose to the rank of, of uh, staff sergeant and became this, uh, the regimental sergeant major when he was 19. And so when they when they dra when they uh, uh, pulled everybody in in 1940 when they and they, when they all went up to uh, 
uh, were all activated and all and sent down to Camp Murray down there in Fort Lewis. Uh, he was the youngest guy in the outfit, but he was the he was the top kick. So uh, in the spring of in February of 40, 42, they went overseas, and uh, uh, he was. Uh, when he went over there, they, I guess that that final the end of that year, they finally gave him a field promotion to a second lieutenant, so he was a second lieutenant all during the, during the uh, during the war. He finally made first lieutenant just before he got out, and uh, my dad made was a sergeant, was a master sergeant, and he made warrant officer and was over there. And but they, as I said, they uh, they were the ones that kept us. He kept us going because we wouldn't hear from him for six and eight weeks at a time, and uh, uh, and I tried to get in the navy before I did get in the navy, and of course they kept turning me down and what have you. And I think I wonder if some of it could have been that that I was a remaining adult uh, son in the family, and things were pretty bleak at that time. But anyway, I. Uh, uh, so I got off the ship, and I, or I got my notice that I was to report to the LSM-172 in San Francisco. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with LSMs. It's amphibs. It's a, it's a sort of an open, well-decked type ship with, a, with the wheelhouse on the, on the starboard side in a tall tower. And uh, uh, they finally brought one back from Greece a couple years ago. They finally found one still in service and brought it back so we do have one left in the in the in the <laughs> for people to look at but uh, so I reported aboard this I, I went to Long Beach flew out to Long Beach uh, got to, uh, we had my 10 days leave and then I was supposed to we went up to my wife and I went up to San Francisco to report aboard ship when I got up there I checked in they said this the ships in San Diego you'll have to go back down there so we went back down to uh, to Long Beach, and then they drove me down to San Francisco, to San Diego on Sunday, and uh, uh, I checked in with the the people down on the dock to get on. They, uh, uh, basically, the boat, the ship was supposed to be scheduled for China, so I figured that I was, I was leaving for a while. So I took all my stuff and went down to the to the dock, and they. Uh, I got into one of the nickel snatchers there to go out to the ship, and out to the uh, the the, uh, uh, the buoy that was supposed to be tied up at, and there was a there was a repair ship out there, but no LSM. So I got out there, and they dropped me there, and the guys on the repair ship wouldn't help me a bit. They wouldn't they they couldn't even be bothered with it. That's that's your problem, buddy. So I had to wait till another deal came down, and it was clear down the other end of the clear down the other end of the San Diego Bay. So I reported aboard pretty late that night, and uh, we got on this ship, and uh, there were three ensigns. One of them had reported on, he just got his commission from from University of Oklahoma. He was from Stamps, Arkansas. <coughs> and the other one was uh, uh, Bob Thomas, was had been on the Montpelier with me on the East Coast, so we were friends. So there were three ensigns, and the, and the commanding officer was Lieutenant Junior Grade, who, had uh, was the only one on the ship that had been on the ship during its service in the Pacific. Everybody else had been demobilized and sent off. And we had uh, the whole crew was just brand new recruits out of, of uh, <laughs> out of the training centers. And so uh, I was made executive officer because I was the oldest and I'd been in the longest and I'd. Uh, uh, and after all, all my training had been in right out of that same area, but UCLA. <laughs> so, uh, but then we were, I was the executive officer, navigator, and uh, uh, damage control officer. Bob Thomas was the uh, supply officer, the uh, gunnery officer, and ordnance officer, communications officer. And Don Nunn was the engineering officer. And the commanding officer was commanding officer in morale. And this is all he did. He was he was about six months older than I was. He was a high school dropout that had got his commission when they needed. Uh, he j got, dropped out of high school when he was about a junior and joined the Navy and became a quartermaster. And when he uh, uh, when they started building all these amphibs, they needed navigators. 
So they said any quartermaster that wants to wants a commission, we can give you a temporary commission. So they gave him a commission, and he was the navigator on this ship when it was in the South Pacific. And when it came back, he was the only regular Navy man on there, and so he stayed on and, and it was made uh, was the commanding officer. But uh, I, I hate to say it, but he's of all the people I ever met in my life, he was the least most least desirable of any of them I ever met. I mean, he was, uh, he just didn't have any of the, the things he'd, he'd presented us because we all had college and, uh, you know, and he'd, he hadn't even finished high school. And so he was, uh, and as, as, time, as we operated out of San Diego, we, uh, we were towing targets for practice and we were carrying freight up and down the coast. And one, one day we were carrying a fire, two fire engines from Port Wainibi, uh, or no, two Port Wainibi from, from Long Beach. And as we came around the point there by uh, uh, the, uh, just out of, the, of Long Beach, we saw a fishing boat on fire. And so all the guys jumped on the fire on the fire fire truck and you know and put the gear on and started <laughs> ringing the bells and shooting the sirens and everything else and i guess the guys on the boat were real upset because i think it was a planned planned deal you know were, get away from here get away from here <laughs> so but so we had things like that happen during the whole time and and so we spent the oh, well so the first week i were on the we were on the ship we were on an alert we had to we couldn't go do anything where you could uh, uh, be away from the ship where you couldn't get back in less than eight hours, so we'd get underway, and this went on for six weeks, and so we did all the usual things, you know, and painted the ship and got everything ready to go and everything else, and so I had to go up to, to Long Beach to take some stuff up to the the superior staff up there in Long Beach at the, the, the uh, uh, Terminal Island, and uh, the, our commanding officer said, well, find out how much longer we're going to be on this alert for China. And so I went in, and so I went into the office up there and I said, well, we'd kind of like to know how long, much longer we're going to be on this alert. He said, what alert? That was canceled six weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, I went down and reported this. And so we fumbled around there for uh, doing these things. And one day we were out at, uh, and we were the target for a submarine. We were operating with the submarines, and it was so stormy that the ship would go up in the air, half of the ship would be out of the water, and then it would swing around and come down with a flat bottom and wham. And I watched the, the uh, uh, stanchions that held the lifelines snap off, you know, one by one. Each time it dropped down, another one would snap off and the snap off. So I was looking at that rope that hung down from the, from the wheelhouse, <laughs> saying, well, I might have to use that. <laughs> and so we kept, we, we tried to do the best we could, and quite, it was just really falling, uh, falling apart there. And uh, the submarine would call and say, uh, please maintain radio, sta standard radio procedures. And I said, <laughs> get lost. I said, we're darn lucky we can stay on course. <laughs> so they weren't very happy. But, but we could only, our, our flank speed was 12 knots, and when we were out there doing stuff like that, we were maybe making 8, 10 miles an hour. And uh, so we'd have to go out. We'd have to get up at 4 in the morning to get out there and be on station for them so they could leave at 7. You know, a submarine moves pretty fast. <laughs> so this went on the whole, uh, the whole time, and we, we had some interesting things. And, and the crew, they were, uh, they were from all over the country. A lot of, most of them were, country, uh, were Kentucky mountain boys. And we had one, one seaman, uh, William White, who was a big husky rascal with curly blonde hair, and he was so doggone strong that when we would come into the, if we were coming into the dock too fast, he this ship was 200 feet long, he would swing over the side and kick it away from the dock, and when we have a man overboard drill, he would pick up the life the lifeboat, which was a 12 foot boat, he would over the side and slither down the rope and be in the boat before the dummy hit the water, and. Uh, Somebody asked him one time, he says, what, do you do, what did you do before you went into the Navy? He says, I, was, uh, he says, I worked in a distillery. He says, well, what did you do? He says, well, I carried mash, uh, sacks of mash. He says, you know, these 100-pound sacks of mash. And he says, well, what do you mean you carried mash sacks? Well, he says, the, the, the distillery was 
maybe three blocks long, and it's sort of sort of a, uh, a angled, looked off sort of like a like an L had been squashed. And he said, I'd put one one hundred under one arm, one hundred the other arm, and I had him put a hundred on each shoulder, and then I'd walk down the down the end of the 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 distillery and walk up a flight of steps and walk down another wing and then drop them and then come back and get another bang. What? You couldn't do that. And he says, well, try me. So the ship was 200 feet long, and so he went back and he got four bags of potatoes out of the, out of the potato bin, put one under each arm, one on each shoulder, hiked down the, uh, the ship, climbed up on the uh, second deck, walked back, came down and set him down. He wasn't even breathing hard. He said, okay, okay. He says, well, what are you going to do when you get out of the Navy? He says, I'm going to be the best damn hod carrier in the United States. <laughs> and I said, I can believe it. <laughs> but uh, <coughs> no, they were, and so it was, they were interesting people. And then in, uh, uh, in the spring of 1947, uh, the Navy Department sent a, uh, a notice out that that uh, all of us in the same category, you know, the ones that had extended for a year and what have you, would have to be out by 1st of July to close down right now. And I thought, heck, what, what, you know, that kind of leaves us to, uh, well, where, what, how, because we hadn't made other plans yet. Where I was still thinking seriously about trying to get in regular Navy. And uh, so anyway, uh, we pulled into, we, Got orders to re take the ship up to to, to uh, Treasure Island and get ready for decommissioning. So we went up to, to took the ship up to Treasure Island, and then I went down and got my wife and brought her up to Treasure Island, up to uh, uh, Richmond. So so we got a uh, some uh, Navy housing there, and this this was an apartment that was an apartment. It was just wide enough to for a door and two windows. And so one bed ran across in front of the, under the two windows, and the other one ran at an angle along the wall. And then the back part had a, a, a little separate quarter off where they had the shower and the john. And then there was a sink, and then we had a hot plate. And, and it was small, and there were people, there were, uh, there was an apartment on each side of us, above us on each side of them, behind us on each side of them, and above them. And so if you sneeze, you got nothing but gazunktites all night long. So we were there for, for uh, April and May and part of June. And uh, so I'd have to drive out to the ship uh, every day. And uh, uh, so, so anyway, we, we were getting the ship ready for decommissioning. And so they moved everybody off the ship. And uh, the uh, uh, base exchange it was right next to the electronics school, and it caught fire. And so everybody, the ship, that, the other ship that came up with us that was being decommissioned, the, the captain of that ship took his crew, and they all went over to fight fires. And then all of a sudden, they realized if this fire, if this fire kept going, it'd come down and got their boat, their ship. How were they going to get underway? <laughs> and, and I told my crew, you know, they all wanted to to go down and fight the fire. And I said, no, I, mean, I want a full crew on here this, in case we have to get under air or at least get away from the dock. And so uh, the captain, this other captain comes running back and says, well, if, if it gets back to here, will you get to take my boy ship out? And I said, no, <laughs> you, you can take care of yours. You've, you kind of loused us up during the year uh, because you were a senior officer. So, so then I, uh, uh, as we were getting rid of everything, closing everything down and and cleaning everything off, they came and took the, the 40 millimeter guns off and the 20 millimeters and the 50 calibers and what have you, and a lot of stuff like that, and we were doing that. And then um, uh, we, I went over to, I was having a little, little trouble with my uh, uh, hemorrhoids, <laughs> that good Navy towel, you know, where they use the, 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 the um, wire brushes to, to, to clean the pots and pans, and I think you got part of that through your system. So I went over to the doctor, and he says, well, yours are pretty bad. He says, I want you to report up the Navy hospital and get to take care of this. So uh, uh, the, my skipper got real upset because uh, he was going to lose the guy that was going to be doing all the duty work, dirty work while he was. Uh, uh, so I checked out and went up to Oak Knoll Hospital, 
And of course, that's about 25 miles from Richmond. And so every, more, every day I'd run down and, or I mean, it was, so I went down there and had the, had the surgery and all. And then they, after a few days, they sent, uh, uh, sent me home and uh, I was supposed to check in every day. And uh, so I'd drive back and forth and drive back and forth. And then finally they, they cleared me up and, uh, and I went down and we checked out a, I checked out of the Navy and, and uh, headed north. And we had a rattle in the car and I stopped in the Plymouth dealer to get it fixed and it found out it was the tailpipe was loose underneath and I needed to have a bracket put on there to, so they charged me to put the bracket on and all. We got about 20 miles outside of Oakland and it started rattling again and looked under there and all they had done it take some wire and wired it to the, the, the chassis. And I, if, I, if I wasn't in a hurry to get out of town, I said I'd go back and drive through your, <laughs> through your display window. So uh, we headed north and I, uh, we went up to, got up to Seattle and I checked in there and I went, to, I, I was able to get into the art school that was started by the guy that used to run the Edison Vocational School and so I was there for a year. Uh, I wasn't in the Navy or, I mean I wasn't on active duty in the Navy or anything because there, everybody else was in the same deal. You know, here you got thousands and thousands of people there and no billets for them. And so uh, I, uh, uh, I went back to art school for a year and then I realized, you know, you've got two years of art school and you've got four years of college. You don't have a degree. What's to keep your, if you have a couple of kids and by the time they're up ready for, they're costing you big bucks to maintain them, especially if they're girls. Uh, how are you going to make out if all of a sudden the boss tells you, well, uh, I don't need you anymore. I've got a young man who's in high school or just out of high school that's doing better than you are. And I don't have to pay him very much because his mother's still feeding him or what have you. So I thought, well, I wonder if I went back to, if I went into the teaching field, I went back to uh, the University of Washington and finished up. So I went out and talked to him, and they said, "Oh, yeah, you can get in. You can't can't keep you out because you're already you're already been here. You know, you, 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 but, but they said uh, you'd have to, if you're going to major in art, you're going to have to go back and take all the uh, all these art courses, these beginning art courses that I'd I'd been taking all these years and here. And uh, some of them, when I left UCLA, I'd been managed to take one class in painting." And they said, if you were a regular student here, you could, we would hire you as an instructor. So, I mean, that's about the caliber I was, but here I was back at the University of Washington. I had to go back and take all these basic, <coughs> basic courses, which was kind of weird to do. So anyway, I said, okay, I'll go back to the U. And I said, I'm going to really, really hit it good. And so I... Uh, I would sign up for the classes and I really knew how to study and I knew how to, stuff I didn't know when I first started, you know, I was complete, uh, one of those <laughs> neophyte. <coughs> so I did all right in my classes and what have you. The only problem was that um, to get into the College of Education you needed a 2.2 grade average and I had a 2.197 grade average and that's eight years of classes, 120 semester hours, and so I started taking these classes, and the one class, I got a B in, I should have had an A in, and doggone it, I ended up with just a 1.972 or something, and so I had to run it another quarter before I could, uh, so I finally, so in uh, uh, August of 1949, um, I uh, uh, I was finishing up. I got my college degree, and I was finishing up. I still had a couple of of hours I needed for my teaching certificate and what have you. And uh, the I belonged to an art honorary at the U, and we were having a show over in the in Bellevue. And um, uh, while I was uh, we were doing things there, my my old high school art teacher came by and saw me. She's a real neat gal, and uh, she says, "Hey, what are you doing, Bill?" And I said, "Well, I'm I just finished with you, and I'm waiting. I've got one more quarter, and then I, I, uh, I can I can teach." 
And she says, well, just a minute. She says, I want you to meet somebody. And so she went, we got this gal and brought her back. She says, now, this is Dorothy McElvain. She's the director of art in Spokane, and she needs an art teacher. And I thought, well, I'd turned down that job earlier in the spring when I was doing my student teaching. And uh, she says, well, I need somebody n now. She says, we, uh, do you have your teaching certificate? And I said, well, no. I said, I have these two classes that I have to, to take. They're, they're not hard classes. They're tests and measurements and, and the history of the state of Washington or something. And she says, well, you could get, you could get your, your uh, uh, teaching certificate by, uh, you know, an, a temporary one from the U. If, so she said, uh, would you be interested in, uh, in teaching? And I said, well, I would like to wait until January and get this all behind me so I don't have to go back. You know, I've already been, uh, it was eight years of school beyond high school, and I'm getting a little... <coughs> A little weary, you know, and she says, "Well, but but I need you in September." And so she, uh, uh, so I said, "Okay." And she says, "So you would come over to Spokane, and and uh, you can check on things and sign your papers and all." So I, the the week before uh, Labor Day, we drove over to Spokane, and those are the days when it took you anywhere from eight to ten hours to drive because it was a two lane road, you know, and uh, so we drove over and. Uh, met the principal, met the uh, superintendent, and saw the school for five minutes. And uh, then I uh, signed all the papers, and then we drove back to Seattle. I drove, I, uh, drove down to uh, Olympia and got my teaching certificate. And then I, my brother was on his way back to the University of Pennsylvania Med School, and so I rode back with him on Labor Day, and they dumped me at the in Spokane on Labor Day, and then uh, the next day school started, and uh, <laughs> I didn't know where the school was, and I didn't have transportation. I just had enough money to uh, uh, to have two meals a day and pay for a for a, a hotel room that cost me two dollars and fifty cents a night, and then I go back on Saturday and get new clean clean clothes and what have you while my my wife finished up her her working in Seattle. She worked at Sandpoint Naval Air Station. And so we moved over. And then, so my starting salary was twenty nine seventy a year. Now, you don't do much with twenty nine seventy a year. There were no houses in Spokane for rent. There was nothing. The, you went through the rental section of the paper, there wasn't anything. But we did find a, a house up in the Garland District that uh, this lady had just become a, new, a widow, and her kids bought her a house in town, and then she decided she didn't want to stay the winter in Spokane. She was going to California, so she rented me her house. It was a, it was a converted two-car garage. So the bathroom uh, and the, the shower was a closet where they'd concreted the bottom of it with a drain in the middle, you know, and the, uh, it was heated by a a little oil, little oil burner and what have you, and and, uh, and uh, all the rooms were different sizes, but none of them were standard size, and that was the winter, and it was about two miles two miles from the school. Uh, one morning I got up, and went out to get my car, and found the front of the car sitting on the ground. Both the front tires had gone flat on me because of the cold. It was twenty twenty eight below zero. You know, snow on the ground and what have you, and uh, they had old butyl tubes in the tires, and so they, uh, anyway, they, uh, uh, I had to walk to school <laughs> for, for, so until I could get that stuff repaired. So that was quite a quite a year, and then we uh, we had our usual problems, and so I thought, well, maybe I could get a, a naval reserve paid paid pay job that'll help me a little bit. So I tr tried out at the Naval, Air St uh, Naval Reserve Center, and they didn't need any more ensigns. I mean, they had a lot of them, and, you know, that got off in 45, and here it was 49. And so I, uh, so I, I they were having a, a showing of the uh, Fighting Lady or something down at the Fox Theater, and they went down there, and they had an exhibit, and there was a, uh, an airman there watching the exhibit, and I asked him, uh, uh, if there were any billets out there at the Naval Air Station that I could get in. Just, well, you can go out and talk to the 
two officers that are in charge of that. So I went out and they said, yeah, we can put you on. I became an, so they made me an air intelligence officer. And so I was in an air intelligence group. And uh, this was in, in the fall of 1949. And so we, we operated all during the year there. And uh, this <coughs> certainly helped me. And uh, finally in 50, uh, 1950, our first, our first uh, training duty was going to be at El Centro in California down by the Salton Sea. And so my wife was pregnant, and so I talked to the commanding officer out there at the, reserve, or at the air station, and I told him if I drove down and met him down there, could I do that? And he said, yeah, I says it'd be good to have somebody down there early so they could show people where to go and make arrangements on things. So we drove down to Long Beach, where my wife's family lived, and and I uh, <coughs> called out to the uh, to see if, about getting down to El Centro. I called out to the Naval Air Station and asked them if they uh, um, if they had anybody that could get me down to one of their reserve flights could drop me off in El Centro because I knew they were always doing round robins. And they said, sure, come on out. So I, my wife took me out with my bag and dumped me at the airport on a Sunday. And I went in and the guy behind the, uh, oh, and I'd called out and they said, sure, we can take care of you. So I went out and I uh, went into the office and here was this belligerent looking lieutenant standing there. And he says, well, what do you want? And I said, well, I was told I could get a, a flight down to, somebody could take me down to El Centro. What do you think we are? Some kind of taxi service? Blah, 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 blah. And I thought, oh hell, here I am back to this same old routine, back to, this reminds me of 1946, back on the Montpelier. So, so I sat there and trying to figure things out, and another guy walked in the room and says, hour? And I said, yeah. He says, there will be a plane going down in about, about an hour. And he says, uh, they can take you over to El Centro. And I said, great. So we waited there and waited there, and this little SNJ was sitting there, and so they said, okay, you can go out and get in the plane. As I walked out towards the plane, there, somebody walks out and slips a, two stars in the side of the plane. <laughs> we were taking the admiral down to <laughs> San Diego. He was the admiral in charge of the chaplain corps. So they uh, took us down to uh, San Diego, and it was a real lousy landing at San Diego. I thought the guy was going to smash the plane up, but they got the admiral off, and oh, he was real pleased. Wonderful landing, very, very good. Blah, 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 blah. So, it, so they got me to El Centro, and they just opened the back door and heaved my bag out and had me jump out. They didn't even stop, and when I landed there, it was about 112 degrees. I thought, oh, holy Toledo! And so we were there for two weeks in El Centro, and. And it was uh, it was hot the whole time we were there, and it was a real interesting, a real interesting trip. And then uh, and then they got back to Spokane, and so I stayed. I I was in the uh, Naval Reserve out there at the Naval Air Station for from 1949 until in 1957, uh, the uh, Air Force wanted that place there for a rapid deployment center. And so they talked to the city, and the city dumped the, told the Navy to get out of there. And so we had to get out, and they closed it down. And so uh, uh, I was without a, <laughs> without a job. And uh, a friend of mine who was one of the teachers at school with me uh, called me, and he says, well, we're starting a Naval Reserve Officer School over here at the, Res Na the Naval Reserve Center. And he says, we need a personnel, uh, we need an, uh, an admin officer. And I recommended that they accept you because that's what your that's your billet right now. And I said, fine. So I transferred over there, and uh, I was in this NROS for two years. And then I went on training duty. And we went up to Alaska. And when I got back, I went into to the drill, and found out that the commanding officer had been tra from the the school had been transferred to to San Francisco. And we had a new commanding officer, and he was an insurance salesman, and he was. He was trying to take care of some of his potential clients, and so I got dumped out of a job, and uh, I still had a, I had my designator hadn't changed back to, to uh, a deck force that had been in aviation when I was out there at the Naval Air Station, and so uh, the uh, commanding officer of the Reserve Center made made me the commandant's local representative for two, two years, 
and I, I brought in so many people they didn't know what to do. I, 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 went in, I went out and dug, and so they, they were kind of got on me. And so then they needed a, uh, a training officer in one of the surface divisions, and so I was eligible for that. And as soon as you're a teacher, this would be a good job for you. And I thought, oh, crime, and he went. I, one of the reasons I belonged to the reserve is to give me a little bit of, of a break from teaching high school. And so uh, I got into the surface division. I was training officer. And then just before Christmas, when, after I'd been in there for a couple of years, uh, I, uh, they called me on a Sunday night and said, uh, uh, the commanding officer is being, tra his job is changing to San Diego, and says, you're the new commanding officer. And so I became the commanding officer. <laughs> and uh, that was all right with me. I mean, I was qualified all the way around. It was, it was fine. About that time, I should be, be getting there. And... Uh, so I was commanding officer, and then that was the year. Uh, then when I came up for promotion to commander, they uh, that was the year that they only promoted about uh, they only promoted two people in the 13th Naval District, which would have been Washington, Oregon, uh, Idaho, Montana, and what have you. Uh, only two people were promoted, and they were from Seattle. They were both aviators over there at the Naval Air Station. So I didn't get promoted, and so at the end of the year they. The deal came out that the commanding officer of the uh, had been the commanding officer of the reserve unit for a year and a half, and they said uh, uh, you have to be a commander to be a, a commanding officer of this unit, and so they transferred me out, and, uh, and so I had passed over. So they made me chief staff officer on the group staff, and so uh, I'd been affiliated with that the reserve center over there since 1949. I thought, well, this is this is fine, but so I, they kept me there for a couple of years, and then they kicked me out. They said, "You're, you've got 20 good years as an officer, so you're not." To, to, so uh, I, uh, I finally got out, and uh, I belonged to the Naval uh, Navy League, and uh, I kept thinking to myself, "I've been saving stuff all of these years from the Navy. I've been collecting and what have you, and my father-in-law's stuff and." and some of the stuff my dad gave me from the South Pacific and what have you. I'd kind of like to start a museum out, you know, have a museum over there at the Reserve Center. And so in 1987, I talked to uh, the commanding officer, uh, Herb uh, Herman, Captain Herman, and I told him, I said, is there any chance we could have a, a museum in the, on the Reserve Center here? So she thought it was a real great idea. And about that time, I was changing um, windows in my house, replacing them with, with uh, thermopane. So I saved all my windows and all my liners and what have you and started building display cases for over there. Built a couple of cabinets that were pretty good sized, and put them on wheels and all. And so we started the display cases and started, uh, started things up. And, and so um, we had them in the passageways of the reserve center over there. And uh, uh, as time went by, uh, they, there were two sort of alcoves just inside the, the main door, and I asked the commanding officer if uh, the second commanding officer was there. I said, if I could get some, uh, some, some uh, patio doors to put on the, to enclose this thing, we'd have a big display area, eight, five, eight by eight feet, that we could display things inside and it would be protected. He says, yeah, go ahead. If you can get them, then that'd be fine, because we were strictly on, on our own, you know, we didn't, it's strictly out of my pocket. So uh, uh, I called a, a friend of mine who had been a neighbor, and he owned a security window service here in Spokane. I said, uh, do you have uh, any chance of getting some, some uh, patio doors? And he says, let me do some checking, and I'll get back to you. So he called me and says, boy, are you in luck. He says, we just took two a brand new unit, eight feet wide, <coughs> out of a building, because le they leak. And the company that built them said, well, okay, we'll make new ones. You can have these, you do what you want with them. He says, so you can have them for the cost of installation. So I talked to the commanding officer, and he said, sure, put them in. So we put them in, and uh, they were fine. And so I managed to get two mannequins at a one of the stores was going out of business, and I managed to go down and bid on them, bought two mannequins, a male and a female, and I had one of them in a set of uh, aviator's greens commander uniform, 
And the other one was a, a wave uniform. One of my wife's sorority sisters had been one of the first waves in Northwest. And, and uh, so we had, I had the two of them in this, this case. But well, we were having trouble with a lock. And I went by there one day. Here's the commander with a beer can in one hand and his, <laughs> and his other hand lifting up the skirt on his leg. <laughs> They got the lock fixed right away. <laughs> so, so since then, we've, I, I've been busy with running this museum and expanding, and they expanded it, and they let us move in. They said, you're taking too much space out in the, in, the, in the hallways. So they gave me a room, and that got real full. And then a few years ago, uh, there was a change of command. We got a new commanding officer, a young fellow by the name of Ted Fessel, who's a commander. And uh, I got a call from the existing commanding officer, uh, Commander Jewell, and he says, Bill, get over here. We need to talk to you. And I thought, oh, God, I'm going to have to take all this stuff out and take it home. And it was beginning to build up by that time. We were beginning to get an awful lot of stuff. And he called me back to, to over the reserve center, and he introduced me to Commander Fessel, and, and he said, uh, we've been thinking. And I thought, here it comes. There's that shoe. And he says, um, you need a building. And he says, we have one for you. The uh, radar uh, bomb scoring unit is moving out of the building back there and into the training center there. 